Spiritual Enthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And in today's episode, we're getting enthusiastic about the gestures that we make when we speak. But first, welcome to our first video episode. Video! Very exciting. Thanks to our patrons, we reached a funding goal where we were able to uh, pay for the extra production costs to have a video. And of course, as soon as we decided that... Uh, I couldn't help but just uh, hope that we would do a gesture episode, and so that is our first video episode. So you can see the gestures. Uh, this is also being released as an audio episode in the normal feed, so if you're hearing this, uh, you can listen to it uh, audio only, but you will miss some of the gestures, so you can go to youtube.com slash lingthusiasm to see the full gesture version. And now, gestures! Lauren, they're really cool! You've done proper research on these! I have, yes. How did you get into gestures? Um, I did a Bachelor of Arts undergraduate, and like many people, kind of found linguistics in my first year of, of doing an undergraduate degree and thought, this subject is so cool that I was still doing it and I was majoring in it by the end of my third year. Um, and in the last semester of third year, I thought linguistics was cool, but I really thought that I wanted to do further study in art history. Um, and then in the, the finals class, the final semester, I took a subject called language and culture um, with Barb Kelly, who I blame a lot of my uh, <laughs> Barb interests, Kelly is great. <laughs> a lot of my interests on. Um, and one week of this class on language and culture was about this topic of gesture studies that she'd done some work in. And by the time you get to third year of linguistics, you kind of know about sounds and phonetics and syntax and sentence structure. And you think you kind of know it all. Yeah, and you kind of, you especially think you know it all by the end of third year. <laughs> and that completely changes the more that you study and the less you realize you knew. And, and learning about gesture was one of those moments where I was just like, there's this whole part of language that I'd never thought of before. And within about two weeks of that, set of lectures I had changed uh, my major and changed my future study plans and that's kind of I'd kind of jumped in deep yeah. and have not regretted it ever since and I only really found out about gesture because of you um and <laughs> <laughs> because we were talking about uh part of my book that looks at emoji and you were like this is there's actually some gesture stuff that's relevant to this. Yes, I'm so pleased that I managed to convince you to reference gesture, even in a book on the internet where there's <laughs> technically no people around to gesture. We still we still found that gesture was relevant. Well, and I had the same experience of just, you know, this was more recently, just walking thinking I knew most of how linguistics works, and then walking around being like, this is so cool, I'm slightly spying on people in restaurants uh, and around me <laughs> like they're using gestures so much it's true once you start paying attention to gesture it's really hard to stop and i really apologize to all of you watching this video who are now going to be analyzing our gestures and i'm sure gretchen's going to spend half the episode <laughs> yeah her own hands uh, this is what i was doing when i was i was like typing with one hand and i was like okay so if i do this if i do this with the other hand it was very <laughs> it's uh it's you, you begin to see language as being a much bigger thing and used in a whole different way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that kind of brings us to our first big idea in gesture, which is that it helps with thinking. Yeah. So I think the important thing to say is as far as we know, everyone uh, in every culture that we've come across and speakers of all languages gesture. So it seems to be in the way that we think of language as something that all humans have. Gesture is part of that. We haven't come across a speech community yet who don't have gesture in their communicative little toolkit. Um, even, I mean, not even, but that also includes signed languages. Um, there's a, and you know, admittedly, it's a bit of a gray area for some of them because both the gesture and the sign component use the same materials for uh, speakers of spoken languages, you, have, you obviously have two different channels happening. You have the spoken channel and the, the hand channel for the gestures. Um, but signed languages do have components that really should be analysed gesturally. And I remember when I was learning 
um, I was in an Auslan class and our Auslan professor was showing us a, a story that someone was telling in um, Auslan and then they asked us to, to kind of pick out the signs. He wanted us to tell him what vocabulary we got from the story. And there were a couple of items where we were like, he opens, he opens a can and the sign teacher was like, oh, that's, that's not a sign though, that's just a gesture. And you could see people in the class were really like, um, kind of not confused, but like there is a boundary between what is a lexical item and what is just a kind of gestural representation from the story. So the kind of thing you might find in like a signed dictionary that, you know, is specifically listing the signs and how they interact with each other grammatically. And like, you just decide to spontaneously do that because that's how you interact with the world. Or yeah. That's what you're trying to convey. So, um, that's kind of a good example that all languages, regardless of whether they're spoken or signed, also use gesture as part of their communicative skill set. And an important part of the communicative skill set, because it helps you do things like solve puzzles. Yes. Uh, it helps you do all kinds of cognitive things. Um, so if you are doing particularly like spatial things, so if you're talking about like directions or the relationships between objects, you tend to gesture more frequently. Um, if you are trying to solve, you know, those like rotation puzzles that they make you do in like IQ tests and memory tests and that kind like of which stuff. Which of these figures is a rotation of the one up here? Yeah. And people will like imaginarily gesture them. People, if people gesture to kind of figure out the rotation, they tend to perform better. What's really cool is the gesture seems to activate that kind of spacey part of the brain. And so if you tell people to do it for the first set of an experiment, if you get them to do the same kind of activity five minutes later, they'll still remember, even if they're not gesturing this time, their brain is kind of more warmed up for the spatial stuff oh. and they'll still do better the second time oh, around as really well. Neat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's lots of great experiments. Um, there's a really great summary paper that I'll link to in the show notes about that and some other experiments. I think like when kids are learning how to do math, you can tell them to like gesture and count on their fingers and stuff like that. There is a lot of work in the kind of teaching space that, that gesture really helps with acquiring kind of abstract, complex mathematical concepts. And I think it's probably worth mentioning here that we're talking about the kinds of gestures that you can do, that you do at the same time as speech, and they happen very much in parallel with speech. So as I'm saying each syllable, hey, look, I'm <laughs> gesturing at the same time. Now it broke. I started laughing. And the thing is about like, it's, it's true. And what's really impressive about that is if you think about, you know, if I'm saying you do the rotation task, I'm, I'm starting to move my hand at the, and you do so that it's ready for the rotation task mm. bit, which means that my brain knows where I want to get to, to make this gesture happen at the same time as rotation task. So I'm starting to move before I've even said that bit. So the gesture and speech are really closely timed there and we can really mess this up for people. Some of the gesture experiments <laughs> often sound a bit mean, oh, but no. we, we can really mess this up for people by putting headphones on and delaying their speech by just a fraction of a second. Okay. And if we delay the way someone speaks so they hear their own voice back like a few milliseconds afterwards, um, it actually just completely disrupts their ability to gesture. It <laughs> really, sounds terrible. It's really, really mean. Um, another thing that we can do is um, we can often make people more disfluent by preventing them from moving their hands while they talk. Yeah, there's this, this terrible, hilarious experiment... <laughs> <laughs> where they get people and they put them in chairs and they say, actually, what we're studying is like the physiographical measurements of like whether your skin, you know, is conducting electricity. And so they kind of strap them down and they put like ele fake electrodes on their skin. <laughs> and so they get them sitting here and then they ask them to tell a story and it increases disfluency. It makes it harder. So they say to, more ums and uhs. They, and they find it harder to remember words and it's usually more likely to be nouns. So there's something about gesturing that helps us remain fluent. And I think it's part of why there's that um, kind of public speaking training thing that trains people to use their gestures more because there is a link between kind of fluently gesturing and fluently speaking. Or trains people to do kind of big, simple, bold gestures rather than like putting your hand in your pocket and jiggling with your coins or tapping your pen or something that can be a more distracting gesture because it adds audio. Yeah. Um, Although I guess classically you don't really consider tapping a pen to 
be a gesture because you have an object, but there's a whole kind of relationship <laughs> between whole, what's a gesture there's a whole taxonomy. and what isn't. But you can you can substitute those kinds of repetitive movements for a, a proper gesture that makes you look more sophisticated as a speaker. Sure, and may actually help you speak more fluently in more fluent sentences, which is a nice benefit as well. I also really like the bit about when kids are learning uh, words, so they kids first learning word they first learn words and they go through this one word stage and they think learn things like doggy and mama and papa and uh, you know water and stuff like this and then eventually they end up at this two word stage yeah before that so there's this really nice period in between where we have the um so gestures are kind of important for adults and in their kind of uh, ability to speak fluently but when we look at children we also see that between the one word phase and the two word phase is this phase that you may not even be paying attention to as a parent but as a gesture researcher, I'm paying a lot of attention to, which is the one word plus one gesture phase. And so you'll often get things like um, want or... Um, or like cookie or something like or, this, like I want the cookie. Yes, well, we've got some over there. <laughs> biscuit. My, my, my child will say bicky or biscuit and they'll do the kind of grabbing, which means, you know, it's kind of, it's complex little bit of, of language there. They're not just saying, oh, there is a biscuit. Low biscuit. They are saying, I would like that biscuit. Give me that or biscuit. I want, or want eat the biscuit. biscuit. So that's, they're not saying want biscuit, which would be a nice two word phase. They're saying, or give me biscuit or something. They're <laughs> saying biscuit and they're doing this gesture and the gesture acts like the, the verby bit of that sentence. Or kind of classic like doggy. Yes. Uh, like look, a dog mm-hmm. or Mum, I am alerting you to the fact that there is a dog here, <laughs> which is a bit beyond most kind of 18 month olds. So, um, if anyone can have one, it'd be you. <laughs> and we have a really great, um, increasingly robust set of, of research that shows that the one word, one gesture phase is a really great predictor that two words are just around the corner. Mm, so, that's great. Yeah. Uh, and the gesture is also influenced by the grammatical structure of the language. Yes, so everyone does gesture. Across languages and across cultures, there is some amount, like there's a lot of stereotypes about different cultures gesturing more or gesturing in particular ways. There is some evidence that some of that is true, but actually there's so much variation between individual speakers in languages and even for an individual speaker in different contexts that a lot of those generalizations are actually quite hard to really capture there's not and that's kind of why I like gesture it's um there are so many more questions to ask and we need to think of ways to ask them compared to the kind of corpus analysis you can do for spoken language and it's a really new field I think definitely facilitated by the fact that we have easy access to video now and it's a lot easier to pause frame by frame than back when even when video was film or when there was no video at all and to go through and annotate for all the different gestures even the idea of a large corpus to study in gesture is excitingly new and being able to go back and see what people did um, and being able to share that with other people, it's one thing to record it. It's another thing to be able to pop it up on YouTube or something like that for other people to see. Yeah, I mean, rather than like male VHS cassettes around the world. Oh, this sounds really painful. It, it was a thing that we had to do. So, <laughs> Or like make line drawings so you can include them in your paper rather than just saying the gestures for this can all be found at this nice URL. Yeah, here's a nice photographic still of it. And you can actually see all the videos is a really exciting development in gesture so one of my favorite examples of gesture mirroring the structure of language is from a talk that i saw by susan golden meadow a couple years ago Mm -hmm. um and she gives this example with english and turkish but it works in french as well and i actually speak french so i'm going to use french for the example that's fine (laughs) um i won't make you speak (laughs) Turkish. i know like a couple words in turkish but i i I couldn't pronounce them with confidence so uh so in English, if you ask English speakers to gesture, uh, the ball is rolling down the hill, or even if you make them, do, 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 um, or if you make them do it without, uh, without, without words alongside, yeah. you'll often get something like down and, and like rolling down the hill. Uh, and then if you get Turkish speakers to do the gesture or French speakers in those languages, rather than have, so in English, we have the verb part is roll. And then we have an additional bit that's down. Uh, whereas in French, you have the verb part is to descend, 
this arm to go down, and then you have to add on separately the rolling bit. So rather than having, so the, the directional gesture doesn't necessarily have rolling down at the same time. If I got that right. You did get that right. That is correct. Good work. And so people, people reflect this grammatical structure difference in how they gesture about, uh, you know, things doing these types of actions. And not just because I'm very well trained and going along with what Gretchen said. <laughs> people weren't, weren't being called attention to for this. They would just watch. So English speakers and French speakers or Turkish speakers would watch exactly the same video of a nice little tomato rolling down a hill or... Um, Another study that's very famous for this is Asli Ozirek and Sotara Kita's work, where they made people watch a uh, Looney Tunes cartoon, so one of the characters goes rolling mm. um, across the screen. And uh, so even though they watch exactly the same video, when they're telling the story, their gestures align with the grammatical structure of the language. So a language like English, where that, that way of rolling is really closely linked into the verb, that will all be integrated. And then for Turkish or French... They're, they're more interested in the path, so that descent, and then if there is rolling, it's indicated separately. And yeah. so you see the the grammar of the language shape those particular gestures. Which I just thought was so cool, <laughs> because it's it's not just rolling and down. Like, all of the verbs of manner, like rolling and jumping and yeah, bouncing, got... in English are verby. And I'd been like, oh yeah, in French, you have to say, like to descend while, while jumping, or to descend while rolling, or to ascend while jumping. And even in English, if you want to say this, you have to borrow these very Frenchy, Latin-y verbs uh, to be able to do that. And we know that this is not just because English speakers watch each other all the time and learn these gestures by habit, or Turkish speakers watch each other all the time, because um, there was a follow-up study by some of the original authors that looked at what happens with people who are blind from birth. And even if you're um, even if you've never seen other people gesture, um, the fact that people still gesture if they're blind from birth is quite interesting in and of itself. Mm. But uh, the people who gestured, gestured pretty much exactly the same way in terms of that rolling down the hill or descending and rolling um, than other people who speak the language. So it seems to be something deeply um, kind of embedded cognitively and not something that we just learn by habit. Yeah, so it's something we learn while seeing seeing the gestures from other people, it's we learn it from the from the grammar of the language, and we gesture yeah. that way spontaneously. Another nice piece of evidence for that is some of those original authors also did a follow up, looking at what happens as Japanese uh, speakers learn English. Okay. And um, the studies so far indicate that they do kind of they they do behave differently. To, they don't behave exactly the same as English speakers, but when they're speaking English, they behave more like the English speakers than their Japanese speaking counterparts. Okay, so they've acquired something of the gestural system as they acquire the language. Yeah, as they acquire the language, it kind of reshapes how they conceptualize the movement as well when they retell, retell those activities. I should volunteer for the French-English version of the study. <laughs> there, are, there are increasingly some studies about what happens with your gesture in your second language, so yeah. you, may, yeah. you may be a participant in a All right, study. Yeah, yeah. I want to do this. Excellent. The other thing that I... So we're kind of heading into there already. So gesture helps with thinking. A gesture also helps with communicating. Yes. It's not just, okay, you know, English, I gesture like an English speaker, and that's just how I'm going to gesture. It's also that I can convey certain things with gestures. Yes. So we can modify our gestures the way we modify our language to be helpful. And I think sometimes uh, it's good to think about gesture as being good for us in our own thinking, as well as being good for communication. And I some people try and, you know, make a claim that it's more important for one or the other. I think that takes all the fun out of it. I think it's both. I think gestures are so great that they can do both. As the gift goes, why not both? Why not both? Uh, and so we see with communication. So um, maybe just to, to make you hypothesize, Gretchen. Okay. If we had someone speaking uh, into a telephone... Okay. Versus someone, you know, hands free. We'll, yeah. we'll give them their hands. Okay. Someone speaking into a telephone versus someone uh, in a face to face conversation. Who would you imagine gestures more? Uh, probably the face to face conversation. Yeah. Because. Because the other person can actually see the gestures and they're useful. Yeah. So we can increase the frequency. Even if we. Um, if we're speaking into a telephone versus speaking into a dictaphone that okay. we think no one will ever listen to again. 
we're, we're even less likely for the dictaphone to gesture oh. because we don't think our communication is going to anyone so we probably just don't try as hard to communicate what if you're talking to yourself and you're not being recorded at all do you still gesture yeah people gesture i mean yes you would but like would you gesture more because like i can see myself when i'm talking to myself we'll have to run we'll have to run this study (laughs) so uh yeah we do gesture we do tend to gesture more if we're in a face-to-face situation because we know that our gestures are going to be helpful to the other person i really loved the follow-up study to this which was or not necessarily by the same people, but the similar vein, whether people are cooperative or feeling uncooperative. Oh yeah, this is so. This is um, you know, we communicate, we gesture more if we think we're going to be if we're we're face to face with someone and our gestures are going to be interpreted as useful. But we also um, if it's someone if we're gesturing to someone competitively versus if we're gesturing to someone who we're cooperating with. This was a study where they had people playing a game. So they taught one person the rules of the game Mm -hmm. and then they said, we're going to bring in someone else. And for half the participants, they said, this person is your collaborator. If you work together, you'll be able to earn more points and and win. It's one of those games where you like have to set some objects in an area or something like this, probably. Yeah. And then if you and then the other half of the people, they said, we're going to bring someone in and you're going to teach this person the game, but then you're going to compete against each other in it. Um, and they found that people actually made the same number of gestures. Uh, so it's not just about the frequency. What they found differed was the kind of quality and size of the gestures. <laughs> oh, so you make bad gestures to people you don't like. So you're like, your, your mind still makes all these gestures, but communicatively you kind of make them clearer to the person that you want to help more. So instead of being like, put this right here, you're like, ah, just, just put it over there. Yeah. That's, that's what they found. So (laughs) so the communication, like the fact that we're face to face makes us want to help meet people more, but only if we want to be helpful to them. I really wanted to know like how they got people to be mad. I thought they like told, sold somebody like, Oh, this person's been spreading rumors about you behind your back. They just told them it was a competition. (laughs) They just told them it was a good old, a good old competition. So, Uh, Yeah, next time you're teaching someone how to play a board game, uh, make note of whether you're going to be playing with them or against them and see. Well, there are some games that are collaborative, like Pandemic's collaborative, so maybe people are going to be more cooperative in their gestures versus something like Risk, where you're also going around the world, but you're trying to compete. Yeah. We'll have to to do a study. Yeah, and gestures um, are also useful communicatively. uh, Because they they can portray, they can give information that's not in the spoken channel. and we see this, so for those rolling gestures that we talked about before, mm-hmm. uh, some of the studies have gone back and looked at, they've just kind of quickly counted whether people gestured in the same direction as the original video that they watched. Okay. Um, and people do this like more than 90% of the time. If you watch a character go from um, one side of the screen to the other, you'll represent those gestures in the same direction that you saw them. In the same in the same way, rather than like spontaneously flipping it for no reason. Yeah, and so it's not, and you don't say it rolled down the hill from the left top of the screen to the bottom right <laughs> of the screen, but your interlocutor, the your interlocutor to use the fancy word, the person you're talking to, <laughs> to use the normal words, uh, will also um, tend to remember that you gave that information, not consciously necessarily. Um, but it's part of the information. You, you get a, a slightly different set of information from gestures. Does this work the same way for all languages? So if not all languages have words for left and right, does it still do the same thing? It really depends on the interactional context. So um, again, there's just, I think this is a general thing we can say about <laughs> gesture research is that there is just so much that hasn't been done the work that has been done has been on a very small set of usually European languages. Um, so for a lot of these things, we can often say, that's a great question. And uh, hopefully someone will do this work. Stay tuned for the next exciting three decades in gesture <laughs> research. <laughs> Basically. Um, and it's part of why I get really excited about it. You know, when my students ask questions, I say that is genuinely a good question and we'd love to No one has ever answered it yet. You might be the person who answers this question or helps us move slightly forward towards it um, because we don't have, we have some like very narrow um, contexts in which we know different languages um, use different elements of gesture to help increase communication. So there's this lovely uh, paper by Joe Blythe that I'll also link to along with everything else I've talked about so far 
um, about a language called Murimpata in the Northern Territory of Australia. And this is a language that has relatively few directional words. Okay. Um, but when you look at how people talk about, you know, different locations, they use so many really rich directional gestures that in many ways, um, if you if you were taking a very narrow frame of mind, you might say, well, this language is missing all these words. But if you take right. a broader view of language and gesture, the language is completely capable of doing everything that English does. It just uses gestures for some of the things that English will use spoken words for. So instead of saying as much like right and left and north and south and stuff like that, yeah. they're more likely to use gestures for stuff like that. Yeah. And if people are retelling other people's stories or something, they'll do it the same. The, the, that information is passed along. That information can be retained, yeah. And there are some languages, so English is very... We remember things in terms of north and south, usually. Um, in terms of left and right, usually. <laughs> Definitely not in terms of north and south. You can um, see my confusing gesture there. For, for many people who uh, have got themselves completely lost while trying to read a map. But, um, for English speakers, we kind of remember things as left to right. Um, in other cultures, modern uh, is and necessarily one of the ones that's been well studied for this but uh, other languages of australia tend to do all their directions around north south east and west um so i'd be sitting to the north of you you're sitting to the south of me and when they're my retelling south foot and my north foot uh yeah and so when they're retelling a story they'll instead of kind of orienting it no matter which direction i sit i'm always going to do that left to right for from you to me whereas a speaker of one of these languages will always gesture from south to north regardless of what direction they're sitting in. So that's so neat. Again, each time we gesture, we're bringing extra information into the discourse that we might not have from speech, but we're also, um, that is also kind of influenced by the culture and by the, the language that we speak as well. So we've mentioned that a lot of people have mostly studied European languages and gesture, but you have not. You have studied other languages uh, beyond Europe in gesture. Yes. So I started after that initial, like, wow, this, this field is really interesting. Um, the first thing I did was some work with English speakers, with a little paper looking at just how likely people are to pay attention to particular gestures. So we've talked about the kinds of things you do to show kind of represent actions or movements in the real world. Um, but there are all kinds of other gestures as well. You know, we haven't talked about pointing gestures very much. We haven't talked about um, the kind of very metaphoric gestures that are kind of not grounded in the physical world. Um, we haven't even talked about the kind of gestures that have really specific names and we all recognize like the peace sign or the thumbs up. Uh, which we I mean, can you do. teach a whole course on gestures, so I can do <laughs> oh, we could... 17 hours later. <laughs> yes. Um, so we've just kind of focused on this set, and I was, but I was really interested in whether people, you know, remembered emblems more, those those thumbs up and those peace sign ones, because they have really clear names, um, or if people pay attention to pointing, because we often think of pointing as being kind of the simple and gesture. prototypical. Um, so that was some early work I did with English speakers that showed. You know, the kinds of things that we study in gesture studies, people seem to treat as different from, then again, other phenomena like facial gestures or the kinds of things we do accidentally or unintentionally like coughing or um, those kinds of things. Um, so there's, there's these whole other things that we can do with our body that we also have to think about in terms of these studies but aren't always directly relevant. So that was... That was, that was the first gesture thing you did, and you also went to Nepal and did a bunch of... I mean, you did stuff with the language in Nepal, wrote a yeah. grammar or two. Yeah. <laughs> so um, then I kind of, again, under the very good influence of Barb Kelly, went and did field work in Nepal, and I looked at the grammar and spent some time focusing on that, and then I finally, in the last few years, got to come back to gesture and look at what's happening with gesture in those languages, which is really What is exciting. happening with gesture? If, yeah, not that... Not that you can say it all now, but what, <laughs> is there something that's happening? There's that's still not... so much to ask, and it's great that we have a really rich corpus of gesture recordings and, and kind of general recordings that I can now use to study gesture. So you've got a whole bunch of videos that you're now pouring through. Yes. Um, and it's a nice mix of they do things that are kind of very specific 
to those stories that they're telling and they help them tell the stories but they're also the kinds of gestures that we see cropping up uh, in other languages as well and part of what appears to be a set of things that that humans tend to be likely to do so um, one of these is the this gesture that gets made it can be used without speech this kind of thing it's kind of a without speech it's a very prominent like flicking up a bit of a shrug and it's a like what are you going to do about it okay fatalistic um but that kind of the fact that it can be used as a question you also get it in um it can just be a tiny flick of the wrist where people say are asking a question or they're a bit on someone might be telling a story and they're like oh, what do i say next is it always two-handed do you get one no it can be one hand there's lots of variation um and you see it across the larger i look at it specifically how it's used by shuba speakers who speak a tibetan language in nepal but we see this hand shape used for questions cropping up all over um southeast asia and in india and pakistan and nepal and we also see it related to a lot of other kind of palms up as question i think a shrug Shrug. is very familiar to english speakers And so kind of looking at the very specifics of how it's done in this culture, but thinking about it in terms of the larger... Of the larger family of shrug gestures. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's super neat. Yeah. So kind really of the, great. like, I have nothing in my hands and I'm going to show off how, how empty my hands are. Yeah, there's a whole kind of uh, set of arguments around just kind of why across, you know, speakers of English and speakers of Shuba who... It's not like a historical related language thing. It just mm-hmm. seems to be something about the way humans think uh, and think about space and how they use their hands. And Because we've all got the same, mostly the same set of hands. Yeah. Um, we can do very similar things with them. We all experience our little... Like, we talk about the meat puppets sometimes. <laughs> the way that these meat puppets move through space and time. Uh, we all kind of do the same thing and we can draw on the same resources. That's, that's really neat. I yeah. think that's what makes gesture studies super interesting. It's another way of looking at not just the, the stuff you can articulate outside uh, through your throat, which you can't always see unless you get a little camera or something going. Yeah. Um, gestures are, are very there, and you can see what's going on with them. And uh, you'll probably notice them for the, for the next day at least. You'll be paying attention to what everyone is doing with their hands. <laughs> Have fun with that. We've both been there. It's a, it's a fun position to be in. Don't spy on people too hard, but maybe just a tiny bit. <laughs> For more Lingthusiasm and links to everything mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to Lingthusiasm wherever you get your podcasts. You can even subscribe on YouTube. You can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter. My blog is allthingslinguistic.com. To listen to bonus episodes and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links in the description. Our patrons allow us to do things like make this special video episode about gesture. Thanks, everybody. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our audio and video producer is Claire Gorn. Our editorial producers are A.E. Prevost and Sarah Dopiorella. And our editorial manager is Emily Greff. Our music is Ancient Cities by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!